Hello, everyone. This is Professor Kevin Navertel and the Democracy Commitment Coordinator here at Marin Valley. And I'm joined by my friends and colleagues, Mary Fafleese Dunkel and Dr. Darren Schreck. And we have been meeting uh, about every two weeks on average, uh, sometimes every week. And that's this time it's been about a month since the last time that we've had a, a meeting where we uh, discussed the 2024 election and some of the key kind of developments that have occurred recently. Um, so today we've got uh, a few different topics we plan on talking about, and then maybe some things will come up along the way. Uh, we plan on talking about some of the, um, the big uh, donations that have uh, been collected by the Harris campaign. Um, third party candidate, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has dropped out. He's endorsed uh, Donald Trump, and we'll talk about that. Um, we haven't met since the Democratic National Convention, so we'll talk about how the convention went. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the other kind of down-ballot races, at least at the national level, uh, the race for control of the, the House and Senate. So to start us off, uh, money. Um, I think uh, we talked about before how Democrats, before um, Biden had dropped out of the race, were, were averaging about $48 million a week that they were collecting through the Act Blue platform, which kind of tabulates all donations to Democrats um, all you know, for all races, not just the presidential race. And since uh, Biden has dropped out and Harris has uh, you know taken over as the the nominee, um, on average, Democrats have been collecting 140 million dollars. Um, it's a little skewed by the first week that was well into the 200 million range, but um, they've essentially nearly tripled um, the weekly output. Um, so what do you make of that? Uh, does it matter? You know, um, how does it compare to Republicans? Just kind of any takeaways that you might have? Well, the other, uh, the, key, the key aspect that I thought also that came along with that is that the, the money that's not only just going to the Harris campaign, but the, the Harris campaign being able to give money to down ballot candidacies for Senate and House. And we'll talk more about like the competitive races that are out there for the Senate and House on both the Republican and Democratic side and how they see it for themselves. But that money that's coming from the top down is something that the, the Trump campaign is not doing. It's basically the money that's going into the Trump campaign is for Trump's campaign or for, you know, Trump services or something like that or paying bills uh, on his end. So the Democrats are really seeing this influx of money not only helping out at the top of the ballot, but it's also, you know, for Senate and House races as well. Yeah, right. I think it was just in the Washington Post yesterday, they um, talked about how there's a $25 million donation that the Harris campaign made to down ballot races. I think it would split something like $10 million to uh, Democratic Senate races, $10 million to Democratic House of Representative races, and then it was kind of... Uh, splintered off with the final $5 million for uh, gubernatorial races, um, state legislative races, state attorney general races. So, so yeah, it's, it, and I think since Kamala has been at the top of the ticket that there's been a, a, a huge increase of donations to, you know, democratic candidates of, uh, you know, throughout the, you know, house Senate, uh, state legislative, so forth. So it's it's definitely been a lot of money coming in. The field offices are growing mm -hmm. that Democrats right. have. I think they have a huge advantage that way. I think um, the ad buys, um, I think there was one of the, the, the largest ad buys, a digital ad buy that has ever been made um, by the Democrats. So there's, there's definitely a lot of money coming in. It's going to help get that name, you know, as she's kind of new uh, to this race and didn't go through the... Um, primary slash caucus uh, uh, nomination race that uh, Donald Trump and and historically candidates have, have gone through. So this is a way for her to kind of capitalize on all that, uh, be able to use that money for, for this upcoming race. Yeah, for sure. So first I have to comment on, it's really nice that the three of us are in the same room again. I, I like being able to look at the two of you while we're talking. So that's great. Um, <clears throat> so you asked about does money matter? And I was just thinking about it. I mean, the three of us have talked about this before. We know that obviously in 2016, money didn't matter because Hillary Clinton outspent Donald Trump like three to one and it still didn't really matter. Um, however, I think that the money may be kind of a signal of the growing that, you know, that enthusiasm gap that existed that has now been narrowed and I think overtaken by 
Kamala Harris. And just to give you guys an anecdotal bit of evidence that um, I don't think I've told either one of you yet, because uh, it just happened this last weekend. So my, my husband is more of an independent um, voter, but more he leans more like libertarian, but he's, he's voted for parties, of, um, um, candidates from both parties. Um, but he definitely is more conservative, a little bit more um, to the right, um, moderate. But he sent me a, a thing about getting a possibly get a, getting a sticker from Act Blue um, by getting a not I'm sorry not for a sticker but for a sign about veterans that says I am a veteran I'm neither a loser nor am I a sucker. And I was just reading about the fact that it seems like a lot of more veterans have been really turned off by what just happened this last weekend or the weekend was it the week before with um, Trump at Arlington National Cemetery and going there for, he was invited by a, a gold star family, but then was also taking like um, photographs at other graves. And one of them was weirdly with like a thumbs up that he did. And other candidates have kind of weighed into those waters before, but they've, you know, have, have retracted it or taken it out. John McCain did it, took it out right away. Um, but I wonder if that's just kind of, again, it's anecdotal. It's just one bit of evidence from my own family, but it just, it, that, that to me was really kind of shocking that he was actually willing to like, let's, you know, possibly donate to get that sign because I think it really, it really irked him. So I think that's, at least to me, that's evidence of the fact that there is um, a trend that's been a growing trend and a growing, that enthusiasm gap has completely been overtaken by Harris's people. And not only that, but like there was something in the Politico uh, newsletter today or yesterday from Jonathan Martin saying that there are many Republicans who are speaking off the record that they need to purge the party of Donald Trump just to start all over again. Right. And they're willing to just deal with Harris being president for four years, just so that the, the party can like start from the ground up. And, and Kevin, you mentioned before about like having ground field offices. One of the first things that Lara Trump did as soon as she became uh, the chair of the RNC or co-chair of the RNC is they, they ended up firing many people in the party who were in charge of uh, ground operations uh, for the campaign or who would have been in charge of the campaign uh, ground offices. And, and it, the, the, the ability to like not understand how politics works still like makes my mind, you know, jumbled when it comes to the Trump campaign. And I understand Mary that they won eight years ago, but four years ago they tried the same thing and they didn't win. Mm -hmm. And they're trying the same thing again this time around. And if, you know, using your husband's, you know, anecdotal story that I think there are many people out there who are just like, you know, I just want to start over. Mm -hmm. I, I want to mm -hmm. just find somebody else four years from now and, and have, you know, Harris be a president for four years and we'll just deal with it. And I think there are many Republicans who are going to vote for it, many independents who will vote for just because they want to start something brand new. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, well said, uh, both of you. I, I was just, um, Noting to, to the point of Mary with money, um, uh, connecting it to enthusiasm that um, from a, a recent Gallup poll that 78% of Democratic leaning voters say they're more enthusiastic about voting than in recent elections. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had been lower. And um, for Republican leaning voters, they're at 64%. Um, so um, I'm sorry, let me say that one more time. Democrats are at 78%. They were at 64%, but um, Democrats have more enthusiasm than Republicans. Um, and with um, the number of new volunteers, I think it was like 200,000 new volunteer shifts that occurred just um, for, the, for the Harris campaign just since the um, Democratic National Convention. So, yeah, those field offices are important. They knock, um, they organize door knocking and, um, you know, uh, putting pamphlets out and, and trying to reach voters, targeting voters who they think have a good chance of turning out. Um, um, so it, it all, it, it, ma it makes a big difference. And, and we should, I think we've said this in, in past uh, discussions, but we still expect this race to be within a, probably a few thousand votes. I mean, the 2016 race came down to about 78,000 votes in three states, um, which is, you know, less than than most uh, Big Ten football stadiums, <laughs> right. you know, um, and, and that was Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan in 2016. And in 2020, it was Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin, and that was around 45,000 votes. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, every every vote matters. And so having those grassroots activities is, is really important. But right. it, se it seems like at least that path to victory, though, is has widened a bit 
you know, it was really narrow before. It seemed like it was, if she didn't get those, or, sorry, if Biden didn't get, you know, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, it was game over. Now it seems like that path is, 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 is a bit more, there are a few more options, right? That some of these states are back in play again, which is good. Can I, do you guys mind if I ask you guys a question though? Because I'm, I'm still curious, just, you know, what you mentioned about the polls. I keep going back and forth because I'm hearing polls that are, are are showing that it's you know that the she's about five four points ahead nationally. I mean, I'm wondering if, are we seeing some of this like the residue of 2016 when people weren't were under reporting that they're voting for Trump like we did before, um, and is that going to possibly factor in as an issue in 2024, or do you think that the polls really haven't caught up with what's going on, or are do you both feel that they're pretty accurate because i'm i'm not quite sure yet to be honest yeah i'm not sure either i i think i i kind of look at it and say that the the one aspect that i don't like about polls is that when they show the a the rv and the lv next to the number uh, of people who have been polled the likely voters the registered voters and the adults that i've always liked to look at the polls that say x number likely voters mm -hmm. lv rather than rv because RV simply means the person's registered and may or may not show up. And A, it could be somebody who's registered or not registered, right. okay? And if they're registered, they may not be likely. So I, I always look at it kind of like, you know, hands off in a way that I just want to make sure that it's the likely voters versus the registered voters. At least that's how I see it. And then I also want to make sure that they're reputable poll companies and pollsters that are doing it. And, and I don't know if it's coming from... A, or most people, let's say, don't know if it's coming from a Republican-leaning group or a Democratic-leaning group, or is it from an independent? Is it from a, uh, is it from a newspaper? Is it from a college polling source? Uh, I'm always hesitant to, to look at poll numbers if, if I don't know where the information is coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question, and I don't have all the answers. And I think I did just make a note that I think it, it's worthy of of, of maybe devoting a future podcast to in more detail. So where, where we, um, so today we're, we're lucky to be in the, the Marine Valley libraries podcasting room and, uh, the acoustics are great and it's great to be in person, but right. I think it'd be great to show people maybe on our screen, mm -hmm. you know, of some of the, 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 the things that we like to look at in polling and just to kind of show what some of these battleground states indicate because the national, you know, plus or minus, if, if you're ahead by 4%, that's great to, to win the popular vote, but you don't win the election because right, of that. Right. Right. And we think that there's generally a two and a half to maybe three and a half, four percent 4% kind of electoral college bias for Republicans. So Kamala would need to be ahead by about 4% nationally to, to, to probably be able to translate that into winning enough of those battleground states. And individually, a lot of those battleground states, I think when you look at those polls collectively, when you, when you look at a Siena poll or a Washington Post poll and you put all of these polls together, I think that helps to get more data. Aggregate and it, when they, yeah. that, they aggregate these data, uh, the polls, and you see a trend where Democrats under Biden were, were down a certain percent and now they're maybe up a, a couple percent. I believe that trend's probably true, mm -hmm. that there's been a shift mm -hmm. of maybe 4%. Um, but when you look individually at all those battleground states, especially Pennsylvania, uh, Georgia, Nevada, I, you know, I still see it as a toss up yeah. and, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, yeah, I, I, if we could do that, that'd be let's great. Do that. Even just thinking about, and, and I'll leave it there, but just, the, just the idea of like, how do these pollsters get their, you know, the, they said that the, the easy, the, the most accurate way is by, through phone calls. Well, who answers their phone these days? Right. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't. So, I mean, again, I, I just really wonder at the, the, basically at the efficacy of polling these days in general. So I think that would be worth a, worth a convo. For the and future. then even, then even like if you still want to say that, you know, polling is reputable and we're talking about battleground states, do we add North Carolina into that mix? Because many people have said that that state is a, is a toss up at this point mm -hmm. when about two weeks ago, it wasn't a toss up. So how do those numbers affect the aggregate that we're seeing as mm -hmm. well? Right. I do think, um, and we should probably <laughs> button this topic up since we'll explore it more, but, you know, Trump voters in particular uh, over the last eight years have been less likely to participate in polls, mm -hmm. but the, the non-response numbers are through the roof. Uh, I think some pollsters are, are calling 
for two hours to, to have one completion. Um, you know, it's, it's so, and are Trump supporters less likely to participate than Harris supporters? Um, quite likely. But a lot of these polls model for that too and try to then oversample some of the demographics that are more likely to be Republican. So again, I think that's a great topic uh, and one that we should devote, uh, you know, an entire episode to. Um, so maybe moving on to uh, third party candidate uh, I think I did call this one, and, and maybe maybe this is <laughs> obvious, but you know, I always kind of wondered it, with, the, with the momentum that we saw behind Harris, it didn't seem like Trump was freaking out too much initially, and I always kind of wondered if he thought he had this kind of ace in his sleeve, so mm-hmm. to speak, because um, RFK was was polling in some some places like Michigan really high, even in the double digits, right. you know, and if you could somehow get those supporters and get. RFK to endorse you and wouldn't that be a great way to, to, to have a surge of momentum? Right. Um, so what do you make of him dropping out? He's endorsed uh, Trump. What kind of impact might it have on the race? Well, with Michigan, for example, he can't get his name off the ballot. And there are many people who will vote third party candidate uh, and, and not vote for a major party candidate if that third party candidate wasn't on the ballot. So if, Ken, if Kennedy is not on the ballot in, let's say, another state where his name is pulled, I don't believe that many of those people who would vote for Kennedy would automatically vote for Trump. I think many of them would vote for, were voting for Kennedy because they found him as a protest vote. And then there are those who will still vote for Kennedy in a place like Michigan, which could be, is going to be a toss-up between you know, Harris and Trump. And they'll, you know, they're not going to switch over to, to Trump because Kennedy's name is still on the ballot. So third-party candidates are strange, and I, being one of them, can attest to that. (laughs) You are strange, (laughs) Derek. We love you. uh, One one other thing I I, I wish I could show if we had a screen to show it is is looking at third parties, uh, which third parties are on the ballot in the um, seven swing states of Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. RFK is on the ballot in Michigan, North Carolina, and Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. I do think part of the movement that we just talked about towards Harris came from RFK voters, let's say, the first two weeks of, of, of Kamala entering the, the race. The, the remaining kind of 5% that he may have had towards the end, I think those voters are more likely to go towards Trump. So I, it's been nationally, there's been a lot of pundits like, oh, they're going to split equally. And some of the models have shown that with maybe a, a 0.3% advantage for Trump with those remaining uh, RFK supporters. But I, I think that's a, uh, underestimating maybe the overlap of some of the beliefs of anti-vaccine and some of the other kind of, let's just call it an independent streak of right. RFK that, that, that probably leans more towards the, the Trump uh, voter supporter side than the, the the Harris side. So again, in these, in in places like Michigan, that was decided by 11,000 votes in 2016 or Wisconsin, that was decided by, I believe less than 25,000 votes in both the 2016 and 2020 election. This could be a a big impact. It could be. It could be. I wonder though, if we're also underestimating though, the, how a voter, a third party voter might get turned off at the idea though, that he, you know, he'd reached out to both Harris's campaign and Trump's campaign, then turned around and, and endorsed, Trump. So if your ideals are what they are, then basically you're, you're going to turn around and then vote and, and, and try to ingratiate yourself into either party. Doesn't that show like really how deep do your convictions actually go? And I wonder if that may be a turnoff for some people and maybe they, maybe they won't vote. I wonder, I don't know. I wonder if we're, if we kind of overestimate and I get, again, in, in, in a razor thin margin case that obviously we, we, we have to count every single vote. Um, but I just, I wonder how many voters might be turned off by that. The notion that he just, he dropped out and then just endorsed, endorsed Trump after it also emerged that he reached out to Harris's people too. So like, it yeah. looks like he was angling for a job uh, or a, some kind of a position, a cabinet position from, or, you know, from either, either one and, and Harris's people never even called him back. Yeah. That's the thing too, is that going back to what I said is that many of these people who would vote for a third party candidate already come into the process disgruntled. And if you have, that candidate all of a sudden switch and endorse 
a Republican or a Democrat, I think I'd still be more dis, even more disgruntled and not vote for who they endorsed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't think this is like one big turn on for Robert Kennedy voters to say, OK, well, he dropped out. I'll vote for Trump. I think they just won't vote. Right. And if his name is still on the ballot, I'll vote for him as a protest. Right. This could also be another topic that we could get into more depth later on. But um, of those seven battleground states that we just talked about, the Libertarian Party is is on the ballot in all seven of them. Yeah. The Green Party is on all of them except for Georgia and Nevada. Uh, the Constitution Party, which would, would lean right, is only in North Carolina and Wisconsin. Uh, and then Cornell West is in the same three states that Robert Kennedy is is on, and that is Michigan, North Carolina, and Wisconsin. So, you know, it isn't just RFK that's going to have an impact. Right. Um, I think those other four uh, independent parties, I think, could could also pluck. You know, I, I, and just so if you're keeping track out there, uh, the Green Party, um, and, and that's Jill Stein, if I'm not mistaken. It would be, yeah. Yeah. Um, in Cornell West, those two parties could hurt Democrats, take away votes mm-hmm. um, from Democrats, and then the Constitution and Libertarian Party uh, more likely to take away, siphon off from, from Republicans. So there's essentially a balance there. Although, and Darren, you're, you're kind of the expert in this area amongst the three of us. Libertarian Party has generally a higher turnout than... And and it's not only that they have, I would say, a higher turnout, it's that they are entrenched and ensconced in what that Libertarian Party is all about, that they wouldn't vote for either political candidate if they uh, if their life depended upon it. So they, they're not really taking away from anybody. They're, they're going there and they're voting Libertarian. I mean, they're hardcore folks. And, and same with the Greens. I don't think they would vote for... If there wasn't a Green Party candidate on the ballot, they wouldn't have voted for Biden anyway, and they're not going to vote for Harris. Mm -hmm. So I I never look at it as they're taking votes away. I just think that they're there, that they're they're extra voters, like 400,000 of them, 500,000. I don't think they make a difference in the big scheme of things. I think they are there just to vote for their candidate and their candidate alone. And this would be great. We, uh, like, mentioned the Constitution Party in a podcast. That's pretty cool. <laughs> right. Three cheers for them. It's a part of your bingo card if you're keeping score at home. <laughs> so the DNC, we were going to meet uh, during during that week. It didn't work out. Um, but, um, you know, what, what, what was your take on the Democratic National Convention? So we have four nights in Chicago. Um, st- what? Uh, not too far from where we're at right now in, in uh, Palos Hills. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what, what were some of your big takeaways, uh, thoughts on the DNC? I saw it as tight. You know, they, they kept to the message that they, you know, it was no longer Biden's party. You know, they gave Biden the spot on the first day, and that was the end of it, really. And uh, they gave Clinton, I think, a spot on the second day, and that was the end of that. And they were kind of showing the public, I believe, that there's a new party that's that's being created here from within, that uh, it's a new direction. I, I think even today, it's been a month, almost a month, since the uh, the convention was held, and I think Bill Clinton's speech just finally ended about a couple of <laughs> minutes ago. And uh, but you know they were showing that you know even that the transition from Michelle Obama and Barack Obama to Walls and you know Harris, this is the direction the party is going in, and. Uh, they had uh, they stuck to the message, but also what they did is they showed something that was different than the Republican convention, that they had different voices that were on stage. I think at one point Bernie Sanders made a speech that like preceded what uh, J.B. Pritzker's message was that, uh, you know, that here's a party that one guy is talking about, you know, taxing the billionaires. And J- uh, Governor J.B. Pritzker of Illinois says they don't take it from a billionaire. He's talking about himself, you know, that they're all members of the same party. And uh, the, the messaging from Harris, you know, I, I know that Republicans will say that, you know, she's extremely left of center. Uh, and I have voted Republican many times as well. But I think that the message that she provided to the public was uh, that they're a party of freedom, a party of independence, a party that they wanted to break free from, you know, the past and uh, that their opponents are, you know, the party of the past and the candidate of the past. And they wanted to do something to show the public that they were moving forward. 
Yeah, I wasn't able to catch as much of it um, as I did for the Republican National Committee for personal reasons. But um, I, a couple things that stood out to me, it, what, uh, the Kinsing, Kinsinger speech, I thought was, so Adam Kinsinger, Kinsinger was a uh, Republican House of Representative. Um, he was part of the January 6th committee, somebody who voted to impeach Trump. Um, I thought his kind of message is, you know, Democrats are just as patriotic as Republicans. And I thought it was a pretty good speech. Um, what else stood out to me? Uh, the length of uh, uh, Kamala's speech, I think it was around 40 minutes. And Donald Trump's uh, speech was about an hour and a half. Um, so, you know, <laughs> less than, than, than half the, the time as as Donald Trump, Trump's speech. Um, Michelle Obama, I thought, also really stood out um, in her speech. And then Tim Walz, uh, you know, parts of his speech, you know, to watch his kids' kind of reaction to him, uh, I think was very emotional, uh, especially his son. And I, I know that that got some um, coverage on, uh, on the Internet from, from both the left and the right. Um, so those were some of the things that stood out to me. And again, they... Raised a lot of money that week, created a lot of momentum. Um, I think the ratings were higher than the Republican National Convention um, in terms of the number of viewers. Um, so like Darren said, I think it was a pretty tight um, uh, theme and message. Uh, I, the one thing I would say, I spe- the, 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 the most, most I watched was Monday and Tuesday. And it, some of the speeches were long and they, they talked through kind or they talked, they waited for the applause line. And, mm-hmm. and I think Biden went on at, I don't even remember what time it was midnight or, you know, it was, it was long. And so, um, you know, I think they were trying to fix that over the last two days. And I think they did a better job of kind of, um, keeping people to a, to a shorter script. Mm-hmm. Yes, I would agree with that. I, so I, I have to confess that whether it's the Republican convention or the democratic convention, it has this sort of like cultish like feel to it a bit where it seems like everyone's like just in waiting in like this rapture to be, to be carried up into heaven. Like, you know, in the applause lines. And so I, there's always, when I watch it, I, I always just feel a little bit, um, wanting to like step back from it and, and, and uh, not, not get myself swept, swept, swept away by it. There were a few things that I, I did. I, there was a record number of Republicans who spoke and you must mention Kinzinger. I thought he hit it out of the park too. I, I thought he was great. Um, the other thing that I thought was 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 um, you know if you're to, if you're to compare at least one party to the other, Oprah came in and spoke. All these celebrities that were there. I, obviously, you're going to have higher ratings when you're having these bigger celebrities who might show up. There was talk about possibly Beyonce being there. So people, I think, were maybe watching to see who might pop up next. Um, one thing I thought was interesting, and I, I don't know what the two of you think, but I, I kind of felt like Clinton. Bill Clinton and Biden were done a little dirty. Like I, the idea that, that you mentioned Biden going on so late, I thought that was a bit disrespectful, but I think he was just like, well, I'm going to take my time and go through my speech. And I don't think he was even, this is kind of his swan song. So I think, I think the idea of putting him on that late, um, I thought was, was a little bit disrespectful. And I was really surprised that Bill Clinton was put on so early on Wednesday. Did you, I don't know if you, if you, either of you noticed that or he went on so early. Um, it was like, he was like one of the, earlier speakers, I want to say it was between the, the seven and eight o'clock hour, which I was really surprised that he, that he, and then he, he, he spoke over his time. I think he was given 12 or 13 minutes and spoke for about 25 minutes, but that, that surprised me because then some of the people who came on after I thought, well, that's really interesting that they're having Bill Clinton, you know, sorry. Um, some of the people that came on after to me just seemed, it seemed like an interesting choice to have a president go on that early and then have some people that came on that weren't, did not seem of that same stature. Um, I thought that Harris said her message is great. I think she was trying to come across as very as as confident. I think that that did come across. I echo pretty much what both of you said on on most of this. Um, and I thought, yeah, Gus um, Gus Waltz was adorable, and it was actually nice to see that you know even though Ann Coulter made some kind of nasty comments about him on the web, that there were even other people on on like Ben Shapiro on the right who were like, "Don't do that. Like this kid is he's a, he's a someone's son. Like you, that right. he's not." He should not be in this at all. Don't right. bring his name into this. So I thought it was I thought yeah. it was well done. A little long, but I think they made that switch over. I have to give them props for that quickly turning this thing around, you know, and then and bringing that to uh, from a Biden um, convention to a Harris convention. I thought they did a great right. job, actually. That's a good point. 
Oh, and I do also want to mention, sorry, um, it was interesting that they, they brought on people talking about the Israeli-Palestinian situation and it had, um, you know, some hostages, families of hostage members. Now, the one hostage um, that was we found out this last week was actually killed. His, I believe his family spoke at the convention, um, and there was some kind of uproar of the fact that they did not allow the Palestinians were uh, delegation were asking to be to have a speaker come out and 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 John Stewart made some interesting commentary on that on his on his show after um, on Thursday night, which I thought was really interesting. So I, I I wondered a little bit about that. I wasn't. I think that would have been. I think to allow that, I think would have been better. But um, that was a decision they made. Yeah, right. I I, I agree that. Um the group should have should have had a voice at the at the convention. I I think it comes from somewhere, and, and somebody smarter than me would have to say where that time gets allotted, um, uh, where it gets taken from. But uh, right. you know, so many of these speakers are prominent Democrats who are also trying to make a name for them. You know, w- once upon a time, Barack Obama gave a a really good speech at the DNC. What was that? 2004. 2004. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so a lot of people want to be the next, uh, they want to have a, a speech that also helps catapult them into the national spotlight. And so it, it's hard for them to have their speech be, uh, limited in time or, um, the, the placement of it. Um, I did think Biden talked a little bit too much about the past of what he had done and could have done a, maybe a better job of kind of setting up why he left the race and why it's uh, better to have somebody like Kamala leading. But um, yeah, I agree with the points that you made and um, you know, it, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough for both parties. It's, it's tough to have time in the prime time for all the talented people that they have mm-hmm. Um Hulk Hogan on the right and Oprah on the left. No, they, they had pink. They had pink, and um, yeah, you know yeah, they. Yeah. yeah, but you're right. Democrats more celebrities. Um, I think, and this is also something that maybe we'll talk about in the future. But um, we're getting a little. We've got about maybe five ten minutes left. But um, just the gender gap that we're seeing, and and so you mentioned Hulk Hogan, and the name escapes me. But the Ultimate Fighting Championship president oh dana white you know in the prominent spot that he had at the rnc it seems like you know we we know there's a gender gap that um uh according to an abc uh ipsos poll showed harris has a league of 13 percent amongst women whereas trump has a a five percent lead amongst men but if you break that down a little bit further uh of those men and women under the age of 29 um, there's a, a 51% gap between um, the, the two parties uh, of Trump having like a 13% advantage amongst young men mm-hmm. and um, Kamala having a, f- a 38% advantage amongst uh, women under the age of 29. And so it is interesting to see that um, interesting and concerning, I think, uh, to see that the, the, the kind of polarization of, of our students in the classroom and just nationally people who are age 18 to 29, um, and, and the way that the two parties are maybe using, uh, celebrities and the, the types of pitches that they're making to these groups and how they're trying to get out the vote in these groups. And, um, yeah, maybe just a, a point on that. Anything, does that, uh, any reactions to that? I just never pressure. understood like the the celebrity appeal mm-hmm. in politics. Mm-hmm. They, for me, it it never swayed me one way or the other. Mm-hmm. In in fact, I think for the most part, when if a celebrity talked about something political, I kind of stayed away from whatever their message was. Yeah, I think depending on what it was, but yeah, yeah. I would I would agree. I mean, I but I don't. I also I'm one of those people. I don't have a problem if somebody wants to if some if a celebrity speaks about something. I mean. They have a voice and they're using it. Um, they're lucky they have that platform, that elevated platform to be able to use it. But um, I think sometimes they also try to use it for good and to give a spotlight to people that maybe wouldn't get a chance to normally get their voices out there. Um, I find the, the the that also, I'm glad you brought that up, that it's very concerning, the gender gap that exists that seems to have gotten worse um, it, or seems to be getting worse in this election versus 2020 even. Um, which I don't know if that's more of a social media thing, a result of social media, um, uh, like uh, 
trumping on, uh, younger men seeing Trump on social media more and, and commentary and being more influenced by that. Um, young women seeing things on TikTok about like Roe versus Wade and being influenced by that. I don't know. I don't really know what is actually uh, pushing that the most. Um, but it, it does also show the data seems to indicate also that, that um, black voters, Hispanic voters are kind of seem to be circling the wagons and coming back to the, de- the, de- the Democratic fold. So hopefully, I mean, if you're depending on what side of the aisle you're on, um, that maybe that will kind of um, balance the, balance that out. That out the loss of the young men that we had before, because I know he, young young people turned out in record numbers in 2020. So if you lose a lot of young people in 2024, if you're on the Democratic side, that's that's not not good. So will those other voters that are those other voters that are coming back in, so to speak, are they only going to basically just you know break even, or are they going to help push her over the, to the other side? That I don't. Yeah, I I do know under the last poll that they had in June from the time Siena, there was a 39% gap um, when Biden was still running. There was a 39% gap of between men and women under the age of 29, and so now it's it's 51. So the gap, uh, you know, grew um, 12 points mm-hmm. um, just in that that kind of two month time period. So something to keep your eye on. I, I too agree about celebrities. I also, if I was a Democrat, I think um, would worry, you know, generally speaking, Republicans have kind of portrayed Democrats as kind of the Hollywood elite, um, a coastal elite and, and kind of out of touch with the, the real America, the middle America, the rural America. And, and so sometimes you wonder about having more celebrities. Um, they might, you know, they have a lot of followers online and so they might help in, in getting people registered to vote, you know, Taylor Swift, when she, um, when she had a tweet last October, maybe on, on, on getting people re- registered to vote and they had a record number of people to vote or register to vote on that day. So it, it can help. Mm-hmm. But, um, I, I also think it kind of plays into that stereotype. It does. But I think that criticism is disingenuous though. I think it's almost more like there's, it, they're just mad that they don't have people on their side that are coming out because you know, they do have, they've got Hulk Hogan and Kid Rock and people like that and Clint, Clint Eastwood at an earlier convention. So, I mean, if they, it's not like they're not putting celebrities out there themselves, but it seems like when a celebrity campaigns on a Republican ticket, it's okay. And there's nothing wrong with it. But when, it, when it's a Democrat or a person who's openly you know democratic celebrity and there's more of them, then suddenly they're, they're capitalizing on their Hollywood fame and whatever. And so, you know, I think what Darren was saying is that just in general, he doesn't like it when, when celebrities do it, regardless of what they're doing. But it seems like that, that criticism, I think, on the right is a bit disingenuous. Or maybe people just, you know, Scott Baio is real, whereas George <laughs> Clooney, you know. I, but, but yeah, I see, I, see, I see your point. Um, so I think the last topic we wanted to talk about, Republicans... Uh, showing some concern about House and Senate now. Um, it looked, you know, just a couple months ago, again, when Biden was still in the race, that I think you could firmly say the Senate was was going to be a lock for Republicans, um, potentially Republicans keeping the House. Um, it, you know, I think there's some concern about their, their fundraising, especially now that, as we mentioned earlier, Kamala has donated about $20 million dollars just to the to the Senate and House races. So what are your kind of takeaways on on that topic? All right. So on the uh, from the Cook Political Report 24, House seats are uh, t- considered to be toss ups. Eleven of them are currently held by Democrats or open seats with Democrats who used to have those seats and 13 of them are Republican uh, on the uh, for let's say for the Senate. I have like 11 states. Nine of those states are democratically held or uh, at least held by someone who used to be a Democrat like Joe uh, Manchin and two of them are Republican and for the most part some of these seats that you see on the re- that are Democratic seats like what the one in uh, Wisconsin for example uh, some people were considering that that might be a toss-up but that's probably going to go to Tammy Baldwin that in uh, Arizona it's probably going to go to Ruben Gallego uh, instead of uh, Carrie White and uh the biggest one for Democrats to worry about would probably be the one in Montana, maybe the one in Pennsylvania, and then maybe an outside one would be Ohio. But it used to be that they sh- Democrats had to be nervous about many more seats than that. Mm-hmm. And on the uh, the House side, uh, if we're talking about 24 seats and 13 of them were held by Republicans or currently held by Republicans, I think about two or three of them are those that are from New York, where uh, many of those Republican candidates are trying to, like, uh, portray themselves as down the middle, 
which they probably, in a normal campaign, they probably could do so, but I think they're considered to be, uh, you know, vulnerable seats as well. So uh, the Republicans have a lot more to hold on to on their side, and they might have difficult for the House, and they might have a difficult time doing so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll just add um, John Tester, Democrat senator running in Montana. Um, That's a state that Trump won by 11% in 2020. So that's that's a tough kind of headwinds that he's facing. Uh, he is an incumbent. Um, his opponent has has said, you know, even recently, just within the last couple of days, I don't know if you caught that um, comment he made about um, uh, derogatory uh, remarks about natives, uh, Americans, and um, and then uh, yeah, like you said, Ohio. I think too. That's you know it's a state that Trump won by about eight percent in two thousand twenty. Uh, so Sherrod Brown, again. Um, facing kind of a it's it's more of a red state and mm-hmm. it, it, the last time democrats won it was 2012 um but um they've been pretty easy wins for republicans 2016 2020 and likely 2024 so right uh, democrats really have to though run uh win all of those races right. to be able to to they have a one seat advantage right now and so since I think you said nine of those 11 races um, that are somewhat of a toss up uh, mm-hmm. are currently Democratic held, um, you know, they don't really have any margin for error. No, and I don't. think that those other two would probably be uh, Texas and, and Florida. Florida. Yeah. yeah. So um, and, and, and just for the for for the listeners um the three of you um the 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 senate <laughs> the three of us listening three, right now yeah, right three, right. Uh, we each have our our spouse uh, maybe who who watches um or <laughs> listens but um you know for a president let's say kamala wins and she um i don't know let's say that uh, one of the supreme court members steps down um um sort of mayor or somebody like that if I, I truly think if the Democrats don't have a majority in the Senate, they, they, they won't have their nominee get confirmed. And so the, having control of the Senate is going to be really key, um, of course, for, for many other reasons, too, for a bill to become a law. If you are a Democratic president, you're going to need uh, Democratic allies in the, in the, in the Senate, in the House. So, um, but, but definitely something to keep your eye on. And, and I know that for, 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 uh, those races, it's going to be really tight. So yeah, mm-hmm. I agree. And as far as the, you guys uh, reminded me something about the Ruben Gallego at the convention, um, I thought he gave a great speech and it was just interesting. And you kind of touched upon this too, Kevin, the amount of pride and nationalism and chance of USA, USA at the democratic convention, which is not something that you usually hear. If you closed your eyes and you were listening, you probably would think that you were at a Republican national convention, which I thought was interesting. So you have a lot of these, these men, these, these candidates who are running as, as, um, uh, former servicemen and they're, and they're talking about their service openly and expressing their, their, um, their pride. And I wonder if that, and that's just to find that to be a really interesting kind of not switch, but I'm, I'm happy to see it on the democratic side as well. And I did wonder as well about those comments, um, for Tester and she in Montana, is that going to, is that going to possibly sway some people with 11%? Probably not, but it's, it's getting a lot of national coverage, that's for sure. Well said. Uh, and on that, I think we'll end for today. I appreciate, uh, you know, another good discussion and, yeah. and uh, looking forward to our next one and, and hopefully the next couple of weeks. Bye, everyone.